Thank you, Roxanne. You know, we've had a lot of um, theme based around victory um, this morning, victory that is only possible through Jesus Christ. And uh, my sermon today will also look at one of those passages of tremendous victory. My topic today is how Jesus cared for his friends. How Jesus cared for his friends. And uh, we're going to look at a situation where Jesus meets friends that are grieving, that are in a, a time of real need, and we observe how he ministered to them. But he comes into a situation where something terrible has happened. A friend has died. I remember um, some years ago when I was at Bible College, we, there was an outreach in our city uh, mall area, and uh, a number of us from the Bible College had gone down there um, to just see what the festivities were all about, but as well as um, take opportunity to share the gospel. Well, anyway, while I was there, um, I had a chap come up to Pamela and I, his name was Paul, and he made general conversation, and then he started to share the gospel with us. And so I thought, oh, well, I'll just, uh, let's, uh, let's see how he, how he goes with this. <laughs> and uh, he did a very good job, actually, very good uh, very good presentation. And at the end of it, I said, yeah, actually, I'm a Christian. I'm at Bible college, actually. <laughs> and uh, he asked which college, and I said, Wake Missionary Training College, which is a big Bible college in the city. And um, he said, oh, that's fantastic. I lead a small group at the Church of Christ, and I've been wanting someone to come along uh, to teach about missions. And that's a bit out of my depth. I, Would you guys come along and do a night on missions? And Pamela and I said, oh, sure, sure, we'll do that. So we went a couple of times and talked about missions. And I remember he invited us around to his home for a meal. One night he had this, um, there was a lot of houses in that part of the city, great big weatherboard house, uh, two or three story, and uh, looking out over the, uh, over the city, the big backyard. And um, anyway, uh, occasionally um, had a phone conversation with Paul, but I hadn't seen a lot of him. Uh, and... Uh, for a while, and there was two of the members of his small group, uh, two young adult girls, uh, came up to me just as I parked my car at the Bible College car park. If you want an imagery, it's, um, it was a blue pulsar. <laughs> I parked the car, got out of the door, and these two girls, uh, they're kind of waiting for them. I was just coming back, kind of the lunch break before lectures, and um, they said, Lee, can I talk with you? I said, sure, and uh, we went over to his beautiful gardens at the Bible College and went to one of the out, outdoor coffee table areas, sat down, and they said, um, it's about Paul. Uh, two days ago, he committed suicide. And I said, you mean you're a Bible study leader? And they said, yeah, Paul. And I, w I was shocked. Paul was a very balanced person. You know, some people have really up and down personalities. He's very straight, had a very good job, um, very committed to his local church, uh, and hadn't met his fiancée, but he had a fiancée over in England. And um, he just, honestly, if someone had said, who do you think is likely to commit suicide out of the people you know, he'd be right down the bottom of the list. He just seemed like very, very unlikely that it would be someone like him. And I, I, at first, I'm just thinking, I wonder if it was accidental, some medication mix-up or something. And they said, no, 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 nothing like that. He'd been out with a couple of members of the Church of Christ, a couple of his friends. They'd gone out for lunch together, and they had just assumed he'd gone back to work. But apparently he'd gone home, taken out his rifle, walked down the backyard that overlooked the city, and shot himself through the head. So it was very deliberate. Um, and I must admit, I was struggling to get my head around it. Um, I attended the funeral, and I actually knew his brother better than him. Um, some of you have heard of uh, Youth Dimension coffee shops. They're now called Blue Moose. Uh, with his brother, I'd been on a couple of those. In fact, his brother had been my prayer partner on one of them. So, and that was about, I think, almost over two weekends. So it was probably about nine, ten days long. So I knew his brother quite well. And I'm chatting with his brother at the funeral. And obviously, I'm thinking, I kind of wanted to know more about the circumstances. And uh, he shared with me, um, look, some years ago, um, Paul was in the United States, and he was um, 
uh, rock climbing actually, and he picked up, I don't know what the term he used, he either used bacteria or virus or something like that. He said he picked up something and it causes severe headaches. He's been to specialists, he's on medication, but it, nothing seems to help. And, you know, this is the phrase he used. He said, I think in the end, Paul just did not want to be an inconvenience to people. And so he took his life. Very sad. There's a lot of sad, grieving people over that. Um, Jesus walks into a scenario where someone has just died. It's not been suicide, but there's a lot of grieving, hurting people. To uh, read a, from a Bible commentary here, William Barclay says, Normally in Palestine, because of the climate, burial followed death as quickly as possible. Deep mourning lasted for seven days, of which the first three were days of weeping. During these seven days, it was forbidden to anoint oneself, to put on shoes, to engage in any kind of study or business, or even to wash. So the Jewish folk at the time took grief very seriously, especially the death of someone. And uh, so they're mourning. So Jesus walks into that sort of setting. People are crying. People are grieving. Let's pick up the passage in verse 17 of John 11. On his arrival, Jesus found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Now Bethany was less than two miles from Jerusalem and many Jews had come to Martha and Mary to comfort them in the loss of their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him, but Mary stayed at home. Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you'd have been here, my brother would not have died. I want to suggest uh, reading behind the, just the just the, the statement of that uh, that uh, those words alone. I think there's there's anger, there's hurt, there's obviously grief, but I think really what Martha's saying is, "We send word for you, Jesus. You didn't come. Why didn't you come? You hear all these complete strangers, but when it comes to one of your friends, you don't bother showing up." I think she's angry. This is how Jesus responds. 11.23, Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha answered, I know he'll rise again in the resurrection of the last day. In other words, he's saying, you know, she's, she's responding to Jesus saying, oh, look, I know I'll see him again in heaven. I know he's a believer in the one true God. But then Jesus says this statement, verse 25. I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live, even though they die. And whoever believes, and, ever, and whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe in this? That's probably the first time Jesus had ever said that publicly. I am the resurrection and the life. And I think what Jesus is trying to do here in this moment of grief and hurt and anger, I believe he's endeavouring to minister God's truth into Martha's life. He's ministering God's truth. Let's put that slide up. Minister God's truth. Jesus ministers God's truth. It's one of the ways he reaches out to his friends when they're in need. You know, um, there was a... Uh, a, a pastor who was um, a new pastor in my church around this time, uh, Newton Baptist, and his name was Peter. He'd just been appointed. He had just finished Bible college at Whitley, uh, the Bible seminary here, the Baptist seminary here in uh, Melbourne. And um, I remember him speaking on this passage. And one of the things he said about it was, he said, I remember when um, we were in fourth year at Bible college and one of the things we had to do was get used to hospital visitation. And I was at a hospital and I was visiting the lady. I, I didn't know her, but I was visiting some people who had a terminal illness. One lady, she was dying of cancer, and um, he, you know, sits, he's sitting kind of on the edge of a bed, and at one point he said, I found myself just saying to her, oh, you'll get better, you'll get better. And he said in his sermon, I don't know why I said that. It's just like a phrase that people say. It's like a pat answer when you don't know what to say. I didn't believe that. And then he went on to say of this passage, what Jesus is doing here is not a pat answer. 
In fact, he probably never said the words publicly, I am the resurrection and the life. But can I suggest for you and I too, when we've got friends in need, we also need to learn how to minister God's truth in those scenarios. Minister God's truth. Can we say this together? Everyone as Christians, we need to minister God's truth. One more time, we need to minister God's truth. I'm going to make three points today. That's the first of them. The passage goes on and says in John 11:32, When Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you'd have been here, my brother would not have died. So this is her sister now, Mary. Exactly the same words. But actually she didn't get up in his face, rather she fell at his feet. And she's profusely crying. So she's not carrying quite the same attitude. I don't think she's angry. She's just filled with grief. Jesus responds to her differently. And I guess for you and I as brothers and sisters, when our friends are in need, one personality may need a different response to another. We're all different, aren't we? John 11.33, when Jesus saw her weeping, this is Mary now, and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. Now notice that. Where have you laid him, he asked. Come and see, Lord, they replied. Jesus wept. Jesus wept. Jesus wept. The shortest verse in the Bible. In our English translation, just two words. 11.35 11.35 of John, Jesus wept. Short verse, but so profound in the setting. See, Jesus here, he is feeling empathy for Mary and the others gathered. And he starts to cry. Jesus cries right along with them. And, you know, that's, that's a great reminder to you and I. Because I know God is the almighty, all-powerful God. He's the creator of the universe. And we've been singing about what an awesome and powerful God he is today. But we've also been singing about the fact that he was willing to die for us. And you see, this is very different. The Grecian understanding of gods at the time, and that the Grecian culture permeated the Roman Empire. Their understanding of their gods was the Greek gods had no weak emotions such as sadness, grief, fear, or empathy. So here, the almighty son of God, he's displaying that God feels, that God weeps alongside you. And what do the people see when Jesus shed those tears? Notice verse 36. Then the Jews said, See how he loved him. See how he loved him. You see, Jesus feeling empathy demonstrated something of God's love. Jesus' love for the family too, but also the love of God. Can I suggest the second thing I've learned of Jesus when his friends were in need? He ministered God's love. Jesus ministered God's love. Uh, when I was a young bloke, I'd sometimes get invited to speak at youth events. And um, there was a church called Summer Hill Baptist. I used to preach in their morning service from time to time. Um, but um, they had two youth groups. It's quite unusual. There was a chap in their church that uh, wanted to reach out to the kids from really lower socioeconomic backgrounds that did life pretty tough. And, um, and they provided transport to get them along. There was a lot of them. They probably had about 60 or 70 of those kids came along. And they had a regular youth group. He wanted to mix it all together. But a lot of the, the parents of the uh, church kids didn't want them hanging out with the drug users. <laughs> all that sort of thing. So they thought, look, we'll just run two youth groups. Okay? So they did. Well, I got invited to speak at a, a, a youth camp. But it was, it was the rough nut kids. <laughs> But just before um, I got up to speak, they'd asked a member of God's squad to come and uh, share with them his testimony. And I vaguely knew this person because my brother-in-law was a, a member of God's squad. His name was Fossil. They called him that in God's squad because he was an old dude. <laughs> anyway, this, this, this fella stands up in front of the kids. And um, he's, a, he's a big bloke, six foot two, somewhere around there, well-built, huge big red beard. And he's saying to these young people, 
You know, when I, when I grew up, my dad used to bash me up all the time. Home was awful. And I, I had made a decision that as soon as I'm old enough, I'm leaving, I'm getting out of this place. And um, so he did. I can't remember what age he said, probably around 15, something like that, he left, cleared out. And, but he said to the kids, you know, but because, you know, I, my dad would put me down all the time. It wasn't just the physical violence, it was all the emotional damage that was caused and I, I had all sorts of issues. And I suppressed that emotional pain with drugs. But those drugs cost money and to pay for them I had to do crime. And he goes on to say to the kids, I just messed my life up real bad, real bad. But, you know, a while ago, some years back, I discovered God's real. And I placed my faith in Jesus Christ and he set me free from all that stuff. And then he starts to cry. This big, burly biker. And he's got tears running down his cheeks onto his beard. His beard's getting wet. And he's saying to these kids, please don't do what I did. You've got a chance. To, you've heard about Jesus. You can invite him into your life now. You don't have to mess your life up like I did. And this big burly biker pleaded with them to come to Jesus. And I thought to myself, these kids are seeing the love of God in this man. They're seeing how God cares about them. I remember a, a couple in my uh, last, uh, one of my previous churches, Nary Warren Baptist, uh, we ran a food bank in, in the church and um, it was a particular, we had three congregations, our Latin American congregation uh, organised the food bank. Um, we were one membership but three congregations and um, it was all kind of advertised through the local council. I think they paid 200 bucks a month and it gave them access to lots of food that was you know, nearly out of date and that sort of thing. And uh, they used to have a ton of it. Anyway, um, people knew of the food bank through the council. And I remember this lady, Rachel, turned up at church and she asked access to the food bank. So I showed her where it was. And um, you know, she went through and grabbed some things. It was um, at the beginning of the month, there was fresh fruit and vegetables as well. Um, and uh, she grabbed some fresh stuff, grabbed some tinned stuff, grabbed some rice. She was a Malaysian lady, so I was not surprised she grabbed the rice. Um, and uh, she had a great big box of this stuff. And I said, how are you going to get that back home? And she said, oh, well, I caught a bus out to the church. I'll catch a bus back. And I said, well, where do you live? She told me the address and thought, hey, it's five minutes in the car. And I said, well, do you want me to drop you home? She said, oh, would you? I said, yeah, sure. So I dropped her home, carried the groceries in, and met her husband, Ray. And uh, Ray had, um, he had a, a DVD sitting on his coffee table, Bear Grylls, Man versus the Wild. And I said, oh, do you, do you like Bear Grylls? And he said, yeah, yeah, I do. And, uh, and I said, actually, you know, we've got, a, we've got a course coming up at our church that Bear Grylls recommends. It's called the Alpha Course. He said, oh, yeah, and I pulled out a flyer and it was fantastic because on the cover of the flyer was Bell Grill saying something about Alpha, handed it to him. And, uh, well, they came along. They sat at my Alpha table. I think we had about three or four Alpha tables on the go. They were sitting at my table and I saw, because they're not from any sort of church background, you know, uh, and I saw their questions and their discussion and I saw how God was starting to work in their lives, but something else was going on. Members, other people, Christians who are going to Alpha, they got to know them and they're just doing stuff for them. Oh, you, you need a couch. We'll get you a couch, you know. And so they, they're going around. We used to have around that area, people would often throw out really good furniture anyway. So one of, the, one of the guys with his trailer, he's going around picking up furniture for them and bringing it around. They're getting food. They're getting gifts. Anything they needed, the members were trying to give them whatever they needed because they were asylum seekers. So they had very little support from the government. Uh, so they really were in need. And uh, actually, the guy, Ray was a chef when he was in Malaysia, and um, so he got a bit bored, of course, with some of the more basic food that they're getting from food bank, and at the time, I was catching crayfish, and so I brought him around some fresh fr crayfish. He was thrilled with that. He could do something really exotic with those. Anyway, by the end of Alpha, these two had given their lives to Christ, and I had the privilege of baptising them, and uh, I can still remember they would come out of, because we ran Alpha on a Sunday afternoon in that church, so we had our 10 o'clock service, our 12.30 service, then Alpha in the afternoon, and then our 6 p.m. But as they came out, Alpha was finishing the, the 6 p.m. band to be practising, and, and several times I remember them just standing there, 
watching the band in the main auditorium practice, you know. And by the time Alpha was done, they just started attending that service. Um, but they were loved into the kingdom of God. Can I suggest this? Number two. We as Christians too, we need to minister God's love. Can we say that together? Minister God's love. Let's say it again. We need to minister God's love. Amen. Amen. Just one more point. Let's have a look here at John eleven thirty eight. 38. Jesus, once more deeply moved, came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. Take away the stone, he said. But Lord, said Martha, the sister of the dead man, by this time there's a bad odour. For... He's been there four days. And you see, Martha, when Jesus said, you know, talked about the resurrection, she's very much still thinking about the future. Yes, I'll see my brother again in heaven. He, she is not expecting Jesus is going to raise Lazarus from the dead. Well, she'd probably never seen a resurrection before. Why would she? Why would she be thinking that? And so she's just thinking about, man, putrefaction will have set in. He's going to stink. What are you doing? Let me um, have a look at a, what the tomb may have looked like. Here's a first century tomb. If we have a look at that image. So often it wasn't just a single tomb, uh, as in a single place for bodies. So they'd often have hewn out of the rock, like, almost like shelves. And so there may be several bodies uh, within a single tomb. It's likely it was this sort of tomb. So Lazarus is one of several bodies in that tomb. So it's a good thing Jesus said, Lazarus, come forth. If he just said, come forth, it might have been a whole bunch of people. <laughs> but just Lazarus comes forth. Um, let me read actually a little bit about it. It says, um, William Barclay says, the bodies were enveloped in linen, but the hands and feet were swathed in bandage-like wrappings and the head was wrapped separately. And the tomb door, you're used to it, it's same, same as Jesus' resurrection. It was a great big rock with a, with a groove in the ground where the rock was rolled across the entrance of the tomb, virtually airtight. They seal it in, in position. So same sort of thing. Well, a bunch of people roll that stone away. Jesus says, Lazarus, come forth. It says here in 1140, Then Jesus said, Did I not tell you that if you believe, you would see the glory of God? Looking for a new memory verse? I reckon that's a great one. 1140 of John. Did I not tell you that if you believe, you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. Then Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this for the benefit of the people standing here that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said this, Jesus called out in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out! The dead man came out, his hands and his feet wrapped in strips of linen and a cloth around his face. Jesus said to them, take off the grave clothes and let him go. Wow. Thirdly, can I say here of Jesus that he also ministered God's power. Jesus ministered God's power. Now, I realise when I read a passage like that, you know, I, I, I sometimes chat with people who are quite sceptical of the Bible and they'll say things like, well, you see, this is the, my problem with the Bible. How can you believe stuff like this? You know, it's, it's impossible. People don't get raised from the dead. I mean, that's ridiculous. How can you believe stuff like that? It's clearly just, they're just stories. But even as Christians, sometimes we can think, well, okay, Jesus can work those sort of extraordinary miracles, but how does that really relate to you and I today? You know, um, when I was at uh, Bible College, the, the same Bible College, Wake Missionary Training College, we used to have visiting um, missionaries come and speak to us. And uh, so usually if, if there was a lot of students at the college and there's the faculty would be there at these events. We'd have three of these meetings usually a week. Um, where we'd all gather together, you know, it's, I guess there'd be about 150 of us and we'd have, you know, um, one of the visiting missionaries would be speaking. Well, one particular time we had uh, a couple of missionaries from Bulgaria. Uh, so they were doctors by profession, so PhDs in medicine, uh, they'd served as doctors for a time and then they thought, you know, we've got some money behind us, let's go to WEC, we'll get training for cross-cultural missions and we'll go overseas and we'll use our gifts in medicine, along with sharing the Bible with, um, with folk. And they felt called to Bulgaria. A lot of people certainly in need there at the time. And uh, so they served in that medical profession, often helping people medically as part of uh, their service, but also taught the Word of God. 
they shared with us as students that, um, you know, we went over there and we had quite conservative theology. And so sometimes when we would, um, you know, we would have done everything we could for an individual, medically speaking. And then the WEC team and my, some of the new converts from Bulgaria would gather around that person and lay hands on them. And they said, we saw miracle after miracle after miracle. And uh, our theology changed. Uh, we, we were kind of, our theology was such that we didn't really expect those manifestational gifts you read about in Jesus' ministry and the book of Acts. We didn't really think they were for today. And here we're seeing them before our eyes, time and time again. And they actually listed them. They said, we saw lame people walk. We saw deaf people hear. We saw blind people see. And they added, even occasionally we saw dead people raised back to life. Never think that these miracles we read about in the scriptures were for back then or that's just Jesus, he has that power. The fact is Jesus actually says in John's gospel, you will do greater things than I have done. He says that to his disciples. And of course, we apply what he says of his disciples to us. Because why? Well, because he's operating through us. It's not our power, it's not our strength, of course, but it's Jesus operating through us by the power of the Holy Spirit. To, to give an, another example of this, there's quite a well, there are some well-documented resurrections. Let me tell you the story of one of these. This is Pastor Daniel Ekawaku from Oweri, Nigeria. When I was in England, um, we had, uh, I think, about 70 Africans were in our church, and a lot of them were from Nigeria. So it was mostly Caucasians, but we had a lot of Africans too. And, um, I mean, hearing their stories was awesome. Well, this is one of the stories that is quite well documented. Well, this chap, um, I've seen two or three of the different documentaries. One of them, they go into details about what had happened the morning before a car accident. Um, he, had a, he had had a fight with his wife. He's a minister, a Christian minister, and had a fight with his wife one morning. It was Pamela and I, you know. Um, we, we never do that, do we, don't? No. <laughs> um, and uh, he... he he, <laughs> Pamela just said, why is everyone laughing? <laughs> and anyway, he, he drives off, he's, he's angry, you know, and he's got the, you know, the, 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 um, the accelerator down a bit, a bit too far, driving pretty fast, and he's in an old Mercedes. And anyway, he's flying down this hill, and then he goes to apply the brakes, getting nearer to the bottom of the hill, and the brake pedal just goes straight to the floor, so all the brake fluid had leaked out or whatever had happened, but there was no brakes whatsoever. He loses control of the vehicle. And, he's, and, he, and it wasn't one of those proper, you know, nice new Mercedes that have the airbags. No, it didn't have one of those. It just had the hard steering wheel. His chest just plunged into the steering wheel, caved it in. Well, he was taken out of that car in a critical condition and taken to one hospital and en route to another hospital, he died. I've watched the interview with the doctor who talks through all the vital signs, he said, and I signed the death certificate. This is actually a picture of him holding his, death, his own death certificate. I've watched the interview of Barlington Mann, who was the, uh, the, the, um, uh, the guy who was the mortician of the, the place where they put all the bodies where people have died. And, uh, you know, he said he, he did the usual procedure on the body and the body was placed in a coffin and it sat in my mortuary for three days. Well, in the journey of all this, Daniel Ekawaku's wife felt she had a word from the Lord and she was praying and claiming a scripture. The scripture was this one, Hebrews 11.35. Women receive back their dead, raised to life again. Women receive back their dead, raised to life. She kept claiming that scripture. I'm believing for my husband to be raised back to life. And she kept praying that. Well, ultimately, she went along to the, um, the, uh, the morticians uh, 
the, the morgue, the morgue, and uh, there at the morgue, she's chatting with the guy and saying she wants the body. She explained why. <laughs> she's pleading for her husband to be raised back to life. Well, she had authority over the body, so he, he had to let her take it. And she, anyway, so there's a big evangelistic meeting taking place with um, the late Reinhard Bonnke, was the keynote speaker. Anyway, she tried to bring the coffin in the front of the meeting, and they wouldn't let her in. So you can't bring that coffin in here. What are you doing? And, and so she managed to sneak it around backstage. And she's talking with some of the pastors, because it was a big event, there was lots of pastors there, and she's talking with them and she's saying to them, uh, guys, I really need you to pray for my husband. And they say, oh, certainly, no problem at all, what's wrong with him? He's dead. <laughs> and, and because it was a big event, there's video footage. And it, it, you see him being laid out on a table, dead as a doornail. And they start to pray for him. And after a time, his heart slowly starts to move. They continued to pray. They continued to pray. And gradually he came completely back to life. And, um, <laughs> and he, he, he's saying to them all, where's my file? Where's my file? Because apparently in the three days that he was dead, he was seeing all of heaven. And he had this kind of like, like a file that he was jotting down all the things he was seeing. And then when he comes back, he's expecting that's still there, but that, that didn't come with him. <laughs> And, and so this guy, fully raised back to life after three days, in the mortuary for three days. And fortunately, this is one of those, there are many resurrections, this is one of the ones that's properly documented. And um, by the way, um, I, 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 I've, this particular one I'm talking about I got from Korong, but I bought an earlier one from Kmart. It's called the, it was called the Lazarus Phenomena, and it just in Kmart in their DVD section, and it had this story and another story. A uh, guy, some of you may have heard of him, affectionately known as the Jellyfish Man, who was also dead. He spoke at Crossway, actually, the Jellyfish Man, but it had both of their stories, those in a secular DVD. And uh, I'm simply saying, friends, we need to be a people who are expectant of God's power. We, we live in a society that is always you know, making everything, the concept of science is such that these things can't happen. But we know that God is beyond science. God is the miracle-working, almighty God. Friends, as crazy as it might sound, we too need to minister God's power. When our friends are in need, we also not only need to minister God's truth and love, but also his power. Can we say that together? Let's be a people who minister God's power. One more time, we need to minister God's power. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Now, I know some of my stories have been quite dramatic, but actually those three things, it can be very simple a much more, you might say, ordinary setting. Uh, it was about two or three weeks ago, I remember driving into the Audi car park and there's a guy, it's one or two people there that sometimes beg. And, um, and this guy, I saw him as I was driving in and there's, uh, there's, this, there's this lady there praying for him. In the name of Jesus, <laughs> she's going off praying for him, you know. And um, anyway, um, I thought, ah, oh, there's some, some of God's power being ministered there. And so I, I often have in my car, and you can grab these today too if you want, we have a bunch of these little John's Gospels. They sum up on the information table. Grab one today. Pop it in your centre console or in your handbag or something like that. Put it somewhere where um, you've just got access to it. So I have one of these in my car. So I grabbed this out, went and did my Audi shop, got some cash out for him, and then... Had a little word with him and said, hey, look, uh, mate, I put the cash in, in the gospel, but he could see it was there, and just said to him, you know, I, I find quite often, you know, when there's times of struggle in life, the words of Jesus, you know, they really do help. Uh, this is a short biography about his life, and there's lots of his teaching there, and gave it to him. A little partnership there. I didn't know the lady. She ministered something of God's power, and I had a chance to... Minister God's truth and a bit of love there with the cash. And friends, the reality is those three things, by the grace of God, we could be doing them all the time, couldn't we? So these three things, let's say them together again. How do we care for people in need? Three things, let's say the three together. We need to minister God's truth and minister God's love and minister God's power. 
Amen. Hallelujah. You know, I wonder here today, uh, some of you, you might be feeling like actually you could do with a bit of that sort of ministry for yourself right now. Or perhaps you've got a friend who you think, man, they could do with God ministering truth, love and power in their life. You know, you think of the, the tomb for a moment. And I use it like an analogy. You ever feel like you're in a cold, dark tomb? Or got a friend who's at that sort of spot now? You think of the grave clothes. Ever feel inhibited like you need something unwrapped or removed from your life? Ever feel like that? Remember Jesus called Lazarus by name. His personal God, he would call you by name too. He calls you by name. He knows your needs. You remember that phrase Jesus said? Take away the stone. Jesus too wants to remove anything keeping you from all that he has for you. Your destiny, your calling. Finally, he says, take off the grave clothes and let him go. Likewise today, the Holy Spirit wants to set you free. He wants to set you free. Look, some of you might want prayer this morning. I'm going to go back up and lead another worship song. But um, look, Tom, who is leading communion, he's, he's here to pray for you. Uh, Roxanne, she's here to pray for you. Mareka's here to pray for you. There's people here to pray for you. Although Mareka's going to sing, so I'll, let's make it Roxanne. <laughs> Sue, she's here to pray for you. There's people here for prayer. Why don't you, why don't you guys come forward? We're all going to stand now. We're going to get ready to worship God again. If you guys are, are praying for people, come forward and can I encourage you as a congregation? Some of those statements today that you feel like you want to receive from God by his spirit, he wants to minister to you.